Um, so good morning, Graham, author of The Young Team and of, uh, like, which is a multi award winning um, novel. And of, uh, just saw you last night on BBCI Players uh, Scotland, The Rave. So many questions for you. But the first one, I guess, is um, the most sort of, I guess, like primary one. Why do we, why do we tell stories? And where did yours come from? Why do we tell stories? I think mine came from um, a place of real isolation and um, frustration, to be honest with you. Um, it's funny because when we talk about social distance, right, that's become just part of the just part of the accepted language, you know, but I kind of went socially distant in 2012 when I was trying to stay back from my friends that were taking drugs and I was in my first kind of transformative moments, you know, and I found myself 21 years old, um, really severely addicted to drugs. I'd been living a life of gangs since 13. I had by a miracle scraped through university and I was in my, my last semester of fourth year. Um, and the wheels fell off the bus, as they often do, you know, with addiction in, in that life. You know, you eventually come to a crisis point or a moment of revelation, you know, and, and mine happened in Christmas, you know, and I just realised, you know, that my life was in a complete mess. Uh, so I said to myself, so I need to change. So I stopped taking drugs. I stopped running about with my old pals. Um, temporarily, I might add, you know, and then and that kind of, that frustration, that loneliness, I started writing and then, God, that's that's where the young team was born. So um, I told I told it it was like salvation for me. I, I was looking for a way out. I was looking for something um, to an elixir, a magic flight to get out of my life. It was in a in a big mess, you know. And I think that's the story that you know when we started saying that you were coming on as a as a guest speaker. It's a story that resonates with a lot of our students, and I know that with a lot of our you know, staff members as well, um, who have been somehow exposed or, you know, experienced that kind of lifestyle as well. Um, and I guess, you know, when I think about telling stories and where it comes from, biologically, like we used to, you know, like cavemen and women um, tell stories, you know, for survival in terms of, you know, remember the berries are there and, you know, the saber tooth is <laughs> over there and, you know, sort of as a, I guess, as a way to um, help other people understand that that path is, you know, not conductive to a uh, uh, sort of healthy exit or, you know, this one is where you survive and where you thrive. Um, and I guess your book falls into that category. Did it find the audience that you thought it would find? Um, I think it did, to be honest with you. Um, quite a lot of criticism for this kind of work, the social realism books, is that it's poverty porn or it's trauma porn or misery memoir. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't accept that because so many young people, um, young men my age who probably have never been in a bookstore, you know what I mean, or never have read a, a work of literary fiction, have messaged me to say, like, it's the first book they've ever read. Um, guys that I work with in prison have said the same. Some guys only signed up to education because they knew I was coming as a guest speaker, you know, so they could read the book and talk to me, you know. So I think books like this. Um, make their way into difficult places, into homes that don't have books, into lives that don't, you know what I mean? Just that are not typical consumers of that. And I think I think it makes all the difference. It made all the difference for me. Like my, my whole journey like towards education started with reading a book, you know, so it does happen. And what was like, what was that book? And what's the book that... Uh, everybody knows that one. That's, that's, a, that's, train, that's train spotting, you know. Um, and that, for me, like, in my life kind of it was one of those sliding door moments you know because the um i remember like i had picked um pe tech and p right like all the other guys right in my demograph right and my head teacher had said to me um i tell you anything mr armstrong you could be anything you want in this life but you're not going to be a joiner who understand each other and I, I had no idea what he meant he could see the talent that i couldn't see you know what i mean so he, he encouraged me to take more academic subjects so i did um and then the crash happened so 2007 2008 and all my pals that had these aspirations of getting apprenticeships, you know, um, they didn't happen because all the jobs were struggling, you know. So they told us, basically, if you don't have a job, don't leave school. Um, so I stayed on, and I was one of the only the only few, you know, that working class young men that stayed on. And now I was in a product of a new environment, you know, everybody's talking about going to a university, applying to UCAS. And I'm, I had no clue about any of that, and I had no aspiration. I was there to get £30 EMA money so I could buy more drugs and alcohol, quite frankly. You know, but it's amazing because when you're in that environment, you know what I mean? You, you know, one of the girls recommended reading Trainspotting to me, and I read that. 
and I, three of my friends had just tragically died of heroin overdose as well. Um, so I felt like it, I wasn't a heroin user and I wasn't for leaf in the 1980s. I was an Ed and Erdre in the 90s, but there was a connection there. So the, the train spotting spoke to me, you know. Um, and that's, at that point, I just started saying, I'm going to go to uni like everybody else, you know. Too much, obviously, scepticism for the, for the teachers who just kind of wrote me off, you know. I was a troublemaker. I was a gang member. I was quite clearly one of the bad ones who were, you know, we unexpected trajectory in life, you know, that they... Right, so it was a bit defiance, to be honest. I like that. We did talk about that with Kim yesterday as well, about that, you know, middle finger mentality of, um, you know, if you tell me something, uh, if you tell me I can't do something, I'll go do it twice and take a picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I've got a question in the chat. What advice would you give to our students going through their educational journeys? Just because we're running. I would just I would just say like the world of work is always waiting for you, you know, and to be honest with you, education is somewhere where free thought is encouraged, you know, and seeing businesses, free thought isn't usually encouraged. You know, businesses talk about innovation, they talk about stuff like that. And I worked in like a few different sectors over the years chasing the dream. But I, I didn't have the chance to express myself. Um I, I found myself very stressed out and not enjoying life because I I'm a creative person, you know what I mean? And you know, I was selling, I sold cars for years, right? And it's a very, look at, you make good money, it's a lucrative business, but I wasn't happy. You know, so in education, um, I would say, hang on as long as you can, go as far as you can, you know, and wherever that road takes you, it's going to be a better road than if you, if you don't, you know. Uh, it absolutely was for me. Amazing. And um, coming back to representation, you're, you're giving a voice to like your generation, but also to North Lanarkshire. And how important is that identity for you and, and how important to get it um, uh, sort of, yeah, on the global stage is it for you? Uh, it's crucial because to be honest with you, right, we've got the quite unique thing that, you know, um, we're, we're right next to a big city, you know, so Glasgow, of course, is even for no mean city, you know what I mean, in the 30s, has been known as this violent place of gangs and, you know what I mean, and all the focus is on Glasgow, but to be honest with you, I mean, what's the difference between you know, Glasgow and, like, Coat Bridge and Airdrie. Now, people in Glasgow sometimes don't even know where Coat Bridge and Airdrie are. Like, that. one of my, one of my good, uh, good mates in uni was from Knightswood, and he was, like, he was a gang member as well. But he's like, where's Airdrie? Did he use, like, mad chukters or something? He thought we were, like, you know, the north of Scotland or something. And I went, well, mate, go to Easterhouse, right? Drive to the back road, that's in Coat Bridge, right? Five minutes away, and then five minutes up the road, that's Airdrie. I'm like, so a lot of the social, of course, it wasn't as bad as Easter House, right? But we had our own wee satellite. We've got quite unique geography here, right? And I think it's actually like a microcosm of Glasgow, by the way. Glasgow, you've got a town, right? And everybody goes to the city centre, and then you've got satellite schemes. But well, we didn't have a city centre. We had a town centre, and then we've got the same satellite schemes, you know? So all the, all the gang areas and all the, you know, the housing schemes share a few streets instead of a big city. So there's, there's deprivation and less social movement here. So I was always adamant that, you know, I was going to defend Lanarkshire's autonomy and say, I'm not for Glasgow. I'm not going to just be pensioned in with people for Glasgow. I'm for Lanarkshire. I'm for North Lanarkshire. I'm for Erdry. You know, and our, by the way, the train deer, our accents are a wee bit different. Do you know what I mean? And people pull me up in the book and the one that they always say is eld and old, because they say old and I say eld. We wouldn't say old for them. That's, it's weird that it catches in my mouth. We say eld for and Erdry. It's almost like an E for an A. So there's linguistic differences, there's cultural, but we're, most, we're mostly the same, you know what I mean? But the jails are full of, like, the jails are full of Lanarkshire in Glasgow. And by the way, anybody that's been to jail tends to have that kind of like respect. They know you're doing Coat Bridge well because there's so much that the jail population comes from other part of the world. So. Wow. Um, I know, I know, I know. The difference between <clears throat> the Glaswegian... Don't put that on the, don't put that on the tourist poster. No, <laughs> Um, but yeah, um, um, thank you for saying to the train ear. To me, it's like one big accent, but I'm starting to, yeah, I'm starting to understand a few um, differences. How um, you were talking about, you know, being stressed and not happy. And, you know, I, want, I just wanted to chat about that creative resilience. It took you seven years, am I right, to get your book published? It's seven years for like that moment where I went to Toto and I stopped using drugs when I started writing, right? To like walking into Picador and shaking a hand, you know. Um, seven years, 300. 
three hundred rejections, you know. But they done. I think, to be honest with you, the journey actually started at sixteen years old when I experienced brain spotting, and I said I want, I want a different life. I want to go to university, you know. So I've really been on this road now for fifteen years coming um, for that, and it's all the same. Do you know what I mean? Because that was the only kind of um, thing that made sense to me. You know, a book changed my life. You know what I mean? And then I went to study books, and then I went. To, you know, I wanted to write my own book. You know, so until I had finished that mission, I, I don't consider it done. You know what I mean? Um, wow. You know, and so I, it was, it was um, a long process, you know. It, it stretched my, my endurance to the max, to be honest with you. Like, mm -hmm. there was periods I didn't think I was going to make it, to be honest with you. And I'm not trying to sound dramatic. I was just, like, working seven days a week. Um, I was very thin. I was, like, 11 stone at some times because I was just running myself ragged. And I said, you didn't, you didn't watch in the arts, you know what I mean? Like, there's no kind of how-to manual or... Um, there's no union, you know what I mean, per se. You're your own boss, and sometimes you're not a very good boss to yourself, you know? I like that. That's a good one. Sometimes you're not a very good boss to yourself. How, um, who did you need to be to carry you through those 300 rejections? Like, you know, some people come here the one, like, let alone 300 times. <laughs> How... Who did I need to be? Uh -huh. What did you need to tap into? Um, for me, it was a very, oh God, I've got a lot of faith, you know, like my life changed because of religious faith, you know, and I think like that was always something that sustained me through. And I've got a lot of friends who have kind of, who have got the will to change their life and they, they you know, they've lived violent lives and with drugs and alcohol myself, like myself. But the thing that, why they always go back, I think they're looking for something deeper, you know, a spiritual purpose or meaning, and they never find it. And then they replace that with drugs and alcohol, you know what I mean, or, or a life through criminality and all that. Whereas for me, I find I find God, you know. So I, that was that was what changed my life. And I speak about that candidly, you know what I mean, because it's the only reason I'm probably alive, you know. Um, so I that was for me that was a, a, a fundamental, you know. But I think with any kind of creativity, you have to have that sort of spiritual research or be able to tap into that sort of energy, no? Yeah. I don't think it needs to be a religious faith, you know, it can be belief in anything. Belief in, somebody told me years ago, belief in yourself or belief in the Almighty is the greatest strength you can have, you know, and I think self-belief is fundamental. You know, I think we've got two polemic opposites in this business. You've got people who believe in themselves too much and then you've got people who don't believe in themselves. And by the way, when you look at the other ones, the people who don't believe in themselves are usually the quiet geniuses. And the people that are always shouting about needing agents and this and that, they're the people that need to go back to the fiction and that are work harder, you know, and I think it's just a mentality, you know? So it always struck me as people who say they want to be writers and people who just write, you know, because there's a very kind of idealised notion of what it is to write or what it is to be an artist. And actually, you're going to live skin, you're going to like suffer with mental health, you're going to, I don't know, it's, tough. it's difficult, it's a very difficult job. Even, even, for the, um, even for professionals, it's difficult, you know? <laughs> Um, I there, there's a question um, in the chat about what was it that attracted you to being in the young team? Was it pressure or because you could say you got in with the wrong crowd? I don't, I don't like, I don't like that phrase, the wrong crowd. I probably was the wrong crowd, to be honest with you. In fact, I know I was. You know what I mean? And I think when you need to go back to my childhood, look at my death and my father. You know, my father died when I was three, um, and you know while that. I had an impact when I was a kid, absolutely, in your formative years, it does. Do you know what I mean? Like, I was quite wild when I was young, and I think that was why. You know, and I came from a good home, good home, you know what I mean? Like, my mum worked. You know, I came from a stable environment, but um, you had been rewired by that early death, you know? So I think while that way dormant, you know, actually it did me because my mum never be married, right? So there was never a, a male presence in my, my life, right? So I didn't know about football. Right? I didn't have somebody, you know what I mean? Like to take you to kick about in the park. So I always felt like a bit like less masculine because of football. So uh, football so centric to our environment, you know what I mean? Yeah. So then when I was a teenager, I just exploded, man. I just went right into gangs and like I found father figures in the streets. And it is a cliche, but it's true. You know, and my, some of my pals, the elder ones, I looked up to them like big brothers and, you know, the big brothers and father I never had. So I, but... I surpassed them, do you know what I mean? Like, I went past, I was the one that was, like, always in trouble with the police. I was the one that got expelled from school. I was worse than them, you know, the people I emulated, and I took a lot more drugs and alcohol, you know, because I was I was throwing them into the void of a father, you know, and I've never done therapy, but I'm sure that would be a long conversation, you know what I mean? <laughs> I um, before I move on to the next question, there's something around what you just said with 
um, you know, at the moment we talk a lot about mental health and men's mental health and, you know, toxic yeah. masculinity. Yes. Is that like, do you identify that sort of mentality with that? And is there like, do you have a remedy to that or a sort of like beginning of a I, I think sometimes, um, I think rightly there's an anger towards men, you know, because of gender violence, because of all sorts of stuff, right? And like men do a lot of bad things. And I totally, you know, I'm as abhorrent, you know, I find that as abhorrent as any man, you know what I mean? But I think we're also a bit hard on men. I don't think we show men much love. You know what I mean? And we expect, you know, we um, a lot of these things, they expect to be corrective of men, but they're condemning of men. You know what I mean? And I think I think the male experience is not well known, you know, um, especially by modern discourse. I think there's a lot of male pain out there. There's a lot of loneliness. I've, I've seen it with my own eyes. My friends moving out of the home, you know, where there's, especially in working class communities, where there's a strong matriarchal figure and then they're on their own. And to be honest with you, they, they, they don't cope well, men, in their house. So like when you get into their house, they're just, you know what I mean? They're like wee boys that are in a, an adult world. You know what I mean? And then when you look at a man's existence in the west of Scotland, right? What do they have in their life, right? Go to the gym, toxic environment, right? Go to football, toxic environment, right? Go to the pub, toxic environment. So where's the support for men? Do you know what I mean? Where's the love? And all the modern discourses are around, do you know what I mean? How bad men are, right? How evil men are, right? If we're, we're battering young men over the head with us constantly, conditioning them, do you know what I mean? It's like double, double death up there in a way, I think. You know, so I don't know. I think I think the remedy, if you want love, you know, if you want men to express love, you need to, you know, show them love. Mm. I love that. And I love that you said that so candidly because it's not something that we hear about a lot. You're right. Um, it's a st straight white men, right, are not the most popular for compassion, right? Nobody gives them compassion. But I think it's a shame because lots of young men out there are just hurting. They're just mm -hmm. trying to figure out what it means to be a guy. You know what I mean? And, and inevitably, right, they get taught with the old bad men. Do you know what I mean? Like, they follow people. Like, young men are actors. You know what I mean? As are, like, all young people are. That's why, like, we lassies push prams and we boys run about with guns. They fall into their archetypal stereotypes. You know what I mean? And then when me young men go to the pub and they see other men with a toxic masculinity, they think, I need to be that because that's what masculinity is. When actually, you know, I think there is a more modern discourse. And I tried to, I absolutely tried to do it in the young team. And that might have kind of exposed... Uh, beneath my armour they say you know I struggle with mental health you know what I mean I did have romantic interest in women it wasn't just like bravado driven you know what I mean and I think I think hopefully it does that oh totally no I, yeah I totally oh. I totally see that as you the wee sensitive guy <laughs> uh, we'll see but, but that's the thing right and see that see when you say sensitive right because see if you're not a hard man right you must be sensitive but what, can you not just be sitting in the middle do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, it's yeah. like what do you know what I mean? Like I don't I don't think talking about mental health is sensitive. You know what I mean? Because sensitive communicates weakness. When I actually I think talking about mental health is strength. Loads of my friends have committed suicide, right? Like they committed suicide as strong men that never talked about their feelings. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But maybe if they did, somebody would have called them sensitive, you know what I mean? So yeah. that's why they didn't. I don't know. Oh, that's I what I think. I, I talked to myself about this. Because I've been to their funerals, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah, and you're right. The words with you, the words we use, are so important. And this is where your job is critical. We need, to, we really need to look at how we treat young men. You know, because they are, you know, in Scotland we've got a gang problem, right? And you might not hear it, right? You might not see the press, right? But I went on the record. We have got a gang problem, right? Violence is increasing, and we need to reach these young men in a new way because they're they're in a new world. You know, the things that worked 10, 15 years ago for us don't work anymore. You know. It's an online world. It's a much more insular world, but it's a much more connected world in some ways. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no challenges. Things happen all the time. Is that you know? why it feels that you have a strong sort of um, education, like you have a, a strong what's the word, campaigning for education kind of thing? You're, you're very involved in, you know, you're coming to talk to us and if you're going on podcasts. And is that is that the mission is to... Um, for me, I think it's important, right, because... And education changed my life, you know what I mean? And it's not popular. There's a kind of intellectualism that, that exists in our communities and it came through hard work. Sometimes I'll shake my friends' hands and they'll say, oh, you've, your, your hands have never worked. You know what I mean? And there's a kind of masculine capital with the hands if you've got rough hands or something, you know what I mean? And it, it's true, obviously. You know, but it's just part of our fabric here, our community. You're working class people, you know, like intellectualism and brainy folk, you know what I mean, are sometimes mistrusted or... Are you know viewed as like um, 
they think they're better than me, and God, I don't think I'm better than anybody, you know. Mm. But there is this. Mm. Um, there's another question in the chat. When you stopped taking drugs and embraced a different path, did you have the distance uh, to distance yourself from social groups and friends? And as a boy from Airdrie, how challenging is that? It was very difficult because the guys for Airdrie are my brothers, you know, you, you had like an almost um, military bond, I suppose. You were like soldiers, if you were to call it that, do you know what I mean? And, um, and all, you know, to get rid of them, and I never got rid of them, by the way, because my phone was always, my phone was always there, right? And I still, I still go and sit with these people. They're not like an actual team, my brothers, they will always be brothers. But at that time, until I was in a position where I could say, you know what, I'm drug free, I'm alcohol free, right? And like I can get through this, then I had to stay back, you know, and that was difficult. It wasn't like I kind of dashed for salvation, you know, just for me. I felt I always felt it, you know, and I, like especially when you attend the funerals, the people who didn't make it, you know, because you've detoured off the road, but they haven't, you know what I mean? And sometimes there's just nothing you can do to, to pull them back, you know, if they go too far. So it was very tough, but it was necessary. And I'm I'm now nine years on Christmas Day, funny enough. That's when I stopped using drugs. So every every Christmas it goes by, it's an additional year on that, you know. So I'm, I'm nine years on Christmas Day, and five years off uh, alcohol as well. So and that was a huge commitment, especially at 25 years old. You know, it was a massive decision not to do that, but it was it was necessary. You know. I don't know what to say. Like, can I say congratulations, or do you not think too well to that, or is it just? I don't know. It is what it I don't is. know. <laughs> I, got, I, I was staying at a, a talk recently and everybody clapped, you know, and I felt quite emotional. So I did because it is, I would say it is my greatest achievement that mm. because it is a, like, especially like, drugs, I, right? Drugs are illegal and we all know that, right? But alcohol isn't, do you know what I mean? You can, there's nothing, I've got a right to drink alcohol if I want to drink alcohol, but I choose not to, you know what I mean? And that choice is what saved my life, you know, and it's a choice that just so many young men don't even consider. You know, and, and it's difficult, it's difficult, it's socially isolating, you know what I mean? Like all my pals when they're at weddings, right, or they've got a Stephen birthday parties or anything like that when they're up dancing. I'm like the thin man, you know what I mean? Because I've no, I've no had a couple of beers and it is difficult, you know what I mean? But do you know what, see with time you just relax and every, all, my fa all my people know that I'm just the guy who doesn't drink. Mm -hmm. And by the way, some of them will still say, oh, do you want a beer? Do you know what I mean? And like, there is a, there is a, a dual side to that because you, you, your success reminds people of their failure. Right. And you know, misery loves company. Sometimes people don't like to see people getting on, especially when it comes to drugs and alcohol. Mm. You know, they'd like to see you fall off the train, you know what I mean, and go back to who you were and where you were because it made them feel better, you know, yeah. seeing you in a worse position. And that is the kind of unpleasant side of us, but, mm. but frankly, it's the truth. Shuggy Ben does that so well, you know, uh, the story. Yeah. We see, you know, Eugene and, and Agnes, you know what I mean, at the golf club. I don't know if he's familiar with that seen but what a great scene about addiction you know what I mean because he just wanted her to have a couple of wines you know for his own for his own end and what a, what a spiral of addiction that sent her back into but that's the truth that's what happens yeah I think it's not just with addiction though is there's if if you try to change who you are that your original crowd sort of you know don't they might love you but they don't necessarily want what's best for you like if you're if you challenge how they feel about themselves then a lot of the darker sides can come out um, yeah. How do you, does that make you feel about success, though, and you know the success of the book? And um, is there, as you say, there's a, a double-edged sword, no? You think uh, people something uh, a survivor's guilt, you know what I mean? And, and in some ways, I, I would feel that, you know. But you know, let's see that I balance so much of my work with community work, right? That when I'm actually doing the hard work, it's not easy to walk into Berlin. -y. But I'm I'm an actually anxious person, so putting me in a locked room is, is something that just isn't he very good for me, you know what I mean? So it took a lot of courage to walk into Berlin and to deliver classes to guys that have committed murders and, you know, serious offences, but it's it's important to me, you know, and by the way, it's actually easier in some ways to walk into a prison than a school, you know? Oh, um, why did you say that? <laughs> it is, I know, just because they, <laughs> I made a joke right at the beginning of this and I was like, they're a captive audience in jail, but I know because every single guy who chooses, they choose education in prison, they don't need to do it, they've chosen to be there. Right, and I was wrong to say that, you know what I mean? And I always hold my hands up. But school is a captive audience because they just get told you need to turn up here. If you don't turn up, your parents are going to get fined, and then here's a guy to speak to you about something. So they are a captive audience, mm. you know what I mean? 
but I so no I, I don't in some ways I don't feel bad about it do you know what I mean because I just I try and give back all the time and it's their story as well it was my privilege to tell that story and I feel like an ambassador rather than a you know what I mean Absolutely. for a generation of voiceless men you know what I mean and people that you know that get demonised all the time just like we said you know it's so important to look at the way men are treated you know what I mean yeah. loads of my pals are just suffering, do you know what I mean? Like, I was at I was at the funeral with one who committed suicide. He's got two young children, do you know what I mean? Like, what love did he get for society? Yeah. Do you know, I, I, you know, these questions are so important to me. Absolutely. Um, which is a nice segue into the next question on the chat, which is, um, in your opinion, do you think young teams are as prevalent now as they were when you were younger? I think things change shape with time. You know, I think, and I've absolutely, you know, been hunged on and quartered for saying it because people don't like to hear the truth. But the reality is that a lot of our young men are being inspired by gangs from down south, you know, and the uniforms and the slang have changed, you know what I mean? And young men, by their own admission, you know what I mean? They're not calling themselves Neds anymore, but road men, you know what I mean? And that's a phrase borrowed from London gang culture. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got loads of, loads of pictures on my phone right these young guys with balaclavas making hand signals right of course there was a tragic murder of a young man to Cope Bridge from my community right recently right now that should be a warning to everybody right that we've just not had that for a long time right but there's a reason why that's come and it's because of gang culture you know and the powers that we and, and other people sometimes are a bit slow because there's no data they're like there's no data we can't prove it I know but there's no data because the street the data hasn't caught up yet See, if you go back 10 years ago, there would have been no data for county lines in London about this kind of phenomenon where drug dealers in inner city are going to more remote places to sell drugs. But there's now academia stacked up, right? But all that academia is almost out of date when it's written, you know, because things evolve, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think gangs have evolved in Scotland, aye. So I think we need to be very, very careful. We need to keep an eye on our young men. Things are slipping back. And by the way, when you look at the statistics, right, they buy, I'm not a statistician and I'm not a, a criminologist, right? But the reality is I can read, you know what I mean? And the highest uh, age grouping of murders in England and Wales last year were 16 to 24 year olds, mm -hmm. right? There's 140 murders of young people between 16 and 24. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you there's a gang problem because typically the majority of people who get murdered are in the middle age bracket in their 30s to 40s. There's a big thing going on down there and it's coming up here. It's an, ex it's an import, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then we've got violence rising since 2014 in Scotland and a steady rising up, right? And you can massage the figures any way you want. That is the reality. There have been violence is rising in Scotland since 2014. Mm. So and That's something that you put in the young team as well. Like every once in a while before your chapter, you put some headlines from uh, the press and, and statistics. It, it just elevates the work, I think, in a lot of ways. Because like, I'm not, uh, you know, people say you're not qualified to interpret that, but I'm a concerned citizen and I can read. So... I'm qualified, mm -hmm. you know, politicians and, and public servants work for us. We are the public, right? And it's my community that's, you know, suffering. So, of course, you've got a right to say. People yeah. like to make you think you don't, but you do. Absolutely. Um, so, Barry, <clears throat> excuse me, Barry's saying, as someone who had the same scheme of bringing as yourself, I had the same skepticism when I said I was going to go into further education. Do you think more working class and people who come from schemes being educators would get more people from similar backgrounds into educating themselves and stop the stigma of education being for middle and upper class people? Yes, absolutely. I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I think that, to be honest with you, there's a, a level of exclusion in this country for working class people at every, at every avenue. I, th I think, to be honest with you, we live in the remnants of a Victorian class system. You know, and if you don't speak a certain way or go to a certain school, you know, or go to a certain university or know certain people, then you don't really go on in this country. And by the way, I think that the, the state this country's in, um, with the health service, with all sorts of things, that's indicative of a people who don't have a stake in this country. This country is not run by the people, it's run by a, a privileged few, you know, and I think without getting too political, you know, the way we conduct ourselves as a country, when you look at other countries, I mean, we're so often compared to Scandinavia and Germany and Canada, and, you know, they don't have that. Their class system is much more hidden, you know what I mean? Ours is right, front row centre, you know what I mean? Um, so I, I think more working class people in more sectors, and by the way, we shouldn't just be there because you're a working class artist. Somebody said this to me, you know what, how do you feel being in the only profession where they put working class at the front? You don't say you're a working class plumber or a working class salesperson, you just say you're a working class writer or a working class artist. And I said, well... 
good point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's true. Why don't you know, just be an artist and that's just part of it? You know, every every publishing house in London should just have a working class, you know, you know, seven percent of this country are privately educated. Now do you think seven percent of those people work in publishing? Of course not. It's dominated by the middle class. Mm. We are a kind of exhibit in some ways, you know, when you when I go down to London, you know, whether it's Picador or anything else, um, you know, you're an exhibit, you're different. You know, they need to kind of like modify themselves to talk to you because nobody speaks with a working class accent. You know what I mean? They feel a bit awkward to you. You know, you, you might be a fascination, but you're a, you're a specimen, you know, of working class life. And it still feels that way. And people like Kerry Hudson, they just do so much for this, you know, and, you know, they just get treated that way. You know, it's like, oh, we work working class artist. She's one of the best writers in the country. You know what I mean? And I, 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 it frustrates me, so it does. It's so interesting because, and then I'm going to stop playing the French card. <laughs> but for me, I mean, obviously we have, I'm saying we have not been in France for a while, but there is the same kind of, um, you know, I think it's in every country you have a way of division, um, like dividing the like social classes, strata. Yes. However, it feels, it feels less prominent than it does in the UK for some reason in France. What it does in terms of um, linking into being an artist, there's um, like the main difference between the UK and, and France is that during World War II, France was um, occupied like on, on land basically. And so yes. that has sort of stemmed a lot of our stories and, and how we see the world. And so for us, there's a, a duty of memory that emerge from that in anything that, you know, an artist does will be judged through that filter. Does it uphold the duty of care, the duty of memory? Um, and I feel like there is that in your writing though, a duty of memory of like committing that culture to memory, you know, again, coming back to the survival instinct of, you know, it happened and is there and, you know, this is the way forward. Does that like, in, in everything that you want to achieve in your life, like from now on and in the future, is do you see that through that filter and an idea of like duty of care for the people who passed on that, you know, whose funerals you um, attended? Is there like something like that going on? I, I just think it was a privilege, do you know that? I think it, it was a, a true privilege to do this. And I, it was, it, you know, people say, you know, things like, you know, it was almost impossible for you to do this. And I said, I know, I know, it really was. And it was a kind of impossible mission, right? But when, you know, when somebody died, for example, right, what my friends would do, right, to remember them was go and drink, right? And they would sit in these huddles, you know what I mean? And they would drink and tell stories and all that, right? And I was like, you're just perpetuating the problem, right? You're sitting, the guy probably died because of drinking drugs, right? And you're sitting drinking to remember him. Like, it frustrated me, right? So anything they used to do that, right, I would go and then I would leave. And then I would go and I would open my computer and I would write hard, do you know what I mean? And I would put all that pain and suffering into that, you know what I mean? And I feel, even my family, when they read the book, they say there's such a sorrow in it. We just hate, we don't like it, do you know what I mean? Because it's your own suffering, right? But for me, it was like devotional to these people, do you know what I mean? Who didn't make it, do you know what I mean? Like, I've been in rooms with people, man. Like, all of them are gone, do you know what I mean? And that's that shouldn't be the case in 21st century Scotland and, you know, for young men. I'm 30 years old, do you know what I mean? And I know rooms for a young men to fight. Some that didn't die, but their lives have been changed forever because of mental health. And, you know, I don't know. It's, it, was, it, was, it was a testimony, you know what I mean? I went through all that, right? And I want to tell people about it, right? And I want, and I love, I love when I get the messages for young people, you know, whether it's kids, whether it's, prisoners, whether it's anybody to say that it's had an impact, because it feels like vindication, all this, su all this suffering and struggle to do it was worth it, you know, and it makes me feel, it makes me feel better, you know, so, mm -hmm. healed, it's that healing thing, you know what I mean? Uh, I, I love that you just said that, healing, absolutely. Um, it feels like sometimes in Scotland, success is a dirty word, but you're very candid about um, celebrating celebrating success and you know just coming back to uh watching the documentary scotland the rave on uh bbti player um and it feels like you know there was that aspect coming up as well of like in scotland people don't really sort of yeah again success is a dirty word or you know something like you don't really celebrate what you achieve or even if it's like you know rave being such a an important phenomenon um do you feel like, you know, 
to carry the flag. <laughs> Me, <laughs> oh, no, I definitely. <laughs> in, in the rave thing, right? I just feel like a total ambassador. I was just, I'm just a fan. My wee Spotify what uh, rap came out this morning, and it was uh, trance number one, right? And then two pack. You know what I mean? I've not changed. You know what I mean? I'm just the same as I always was. But for that, right, that was true joy, you know that? And I feel like after all the emotional labour of the young team, right, and the heavy lifting, and it was heavy lifting, right, the rave stuff, that Scotland the rave thing was one of the best experiences of my full life, you know that? And I feel truly blessed to have done it. And I, I can remember sitting in 2003, right, what's that, 17 years ago, right, sitting listening to DJ Rankin, right, and downloading these tunes and experiencing this bootleg phenomenon, a PC DJ, and I was just enthralled by it, I just loved it, I thought it was incredible, the honesty, right, the passion, that there was no money, do you know what I mean, it was for just for fun, do you know what I mean, it wasn't like gangster rap trying to make money or anything, it was just purely fun, you know what I mean, competition, obviously it fed into gang culture and all that, and it was a bit, a bit naughty at times, you know what I mean, but it was fun, and to speak to our boys, and by the way, Airdrie and Coke Bridge are a big part of people, you know that? They, they produced a lot of, a lot of talent, PC DJ talent. Mm-hmm. You know, that some of them we couldn't speak about for, for other reasons, you know what I mean? But we, we took this away, but it was it was brilliant, honestly. I loved it. And then going, I got invited to Colours Fest by Ricky, the owner. And uh, I went to my first rave in years this summer, uh, sober, obviously. But I was behind the stage meeting all the DJs and all that. It was, it was amazing, honestly. It felt like a homecoming. Um, and how <clears throat> how did that project come about? How um, did, was it your so, initiative, or did BBC Scotland? To, do, to be honest, it was a conversation really that happened after the uh, big book club, the Damien Bar show. The executives, I, I, it was a good interview, you know, when I spoke to Damien, and because you're a working class voice, you're a commodity, you're really different, and you just don't hear many voices, you know, like us on TV, you know, so I think they, they liked my voice, you know, and they said, what are you passionate about? Like, what are you? And I said, well, God, I'm writing this book about rave, you know what I mean? And they said, well, see what you can get together. And then in this business, right, everything starts with a conversation, right? It's people to people, right? And, you know, you get an opportunity, right? And nobody likes it, you know, nobody likes things that for you, right? When you're in the arts, right, you maybe get a conversation, right? And then the onus is on you to go and do something, right? So I took the next few days, and I battered it, right? And I made this amazing treatment, right? I wrote the full thing out, all the tunes we would use, right? All the graphics and pictures and who we'd speak to. And I just, I went all out, man. I worked for three days on it and I sent it back, right? And they were like, ah, wow, have you been preparing this for six months? And I was like, ah, guys, I'm ready to go. You know what I mean? I'm buzzing about this. And then that was that. that the energy that I created in those first days, that just, honestly, the show wrote itself. So, and then they, they managed to get just like Scott Brown and all that and Malachi Lee. Like, I was, they were nervous to talk to me. I was like, you don't be nervous to talk to me. I'm nervous to talk to you. I <laughs> But it was amazing. Honestly, I loved it. And we get some feedback for it. You know I mean, even they, they had a factor that the BBC messaged me to say that was the best thing I've seen for ages. But that was amazing. So I was like, wow, that was amazing. Oh, amazing. Was, what, so what, what's next for you? Is there anything that you can talk about? What, what is the next few years? Um, so the, the option of the young team's ongoing, so we're, we're working on that now. I've actually just read the script for episode one, the, the pilot. Um, so aye, that's, that is coming. It's it's material now, so aye, we're doing that, right? So I'm story consultant on the actual um, TV adaptation for the book. And then I'm writing Raveheart, um, which is my next uh, fiction work. So I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's, that was basically um, the idea about Scotland the Raven or that. And it's... So that's open fiction about um, if the, a new Conservative Party managed to actually ban rave, like the Kill the Bill stuff, and then all the, the ravers of Scotland unite to try and fight this thing, and it's, it's fun, you know what I mean? Very much kind of inspired by the protests and stuff like that, but I've been writing this one for years, honestly. I've been writing it for about four years now, um, and it's just the idea, it's just evolved and evolved and evolved, so I that needs to be finished by January, my deadline's January, so... I know, I know. No pressure. I know, I know. I'm up against it. I'm up against it. And then after that, I've just applied to go back to uni. So I'm going to, I've applied for PhD. Um, and I've been trying to get, I've been trying to get back for years. Um, I just couldn't get funding because I just didn't have a good enough, I've got a 2-1 and I merit master's degree, which by any standards is good. And by my standards as a former gang member, it was fantastic. But unfortunately, I just couldn't get funding. So uh, I've had to go around the long way and write a book, you know, practice his research for, for eight years to get back. So hopefully this time I, I'll manage to get in. <laughs> wow. Well, good luck. I mean, Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs>
<laughs> no. um, I guess we were, so when I was talking to Kim about, you know, today and um, Kim is based, uh, so Kim is the film and TV lecturer based, um, yeah. well, I think Kim. <laughs> um, and she was saying how important it was for her and she felt like, you know, we're just a bit, a few years older than you. Um, that, yeah. you know, she, she was saying she felt, she felt she was the first generation of creatives and artists who can actually stay and live and work and create from North Lanarkshire and not have to sort of exile <laughs> to London yes. or to, you know, Edinburgh or to the other sort of bigger poles. How, how do you feel about that? And um, how important is it for you to stay in North Lanarkshire? I mean, I would, I would always advocate the economy in North Lanarkshire, you know what I mean? I, um, as one of its sons, you know, but for me, right, moving away was important, right? Because people sometimes say, can you get out of this? Can, like, seriously, man to man, right, or woman to man, can you actually get out of this thing, right, if you don't move? And I can't answer that because for me, I had to move, right? I had to get out of town. I had to get out of Dodge, right? I went up to Stirling, right, for uni, right? And that was only 25 minutes up the road, right? It wasn't far enough. Right, and I met a girl, and people always say to me, what happens at the end of the young team? Did you go to Paris with Monica and all that? And I say, well, no, I probably went to London with Patricia. <laughs> if that answers a question, you know what I mean? Graham, you're really um, active on social media. Um, is that... Yes. Is that... Uh, are you using it as a tool to connect, um, to work, raise awareness about your work? Like, how do you approach social media and that level of connection? Thank you. Use it carefully is first. Um, I do, I, like, God, I started my social with no followers. Like, I, I'm not part of Scottish Twitter, I don't think. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't just come out with, like, witticisms and get, you know, a million likes for funny stuff. I just use it as a business tool. You know, it's a, it's my shop window. You know what I mean? So I, I put, you know, there's, if you go on my Instagram, there's videos of me tanning bottles of butt fast when I was a teenager. And, like, I'm very candid about my experience. And it adds colour to that. So I like, it's a photo album, you know, a young team photo album. And then... Just a creative business space. So that's that's what I use it for. Far too many artists think it's like a, a an opinion uh, soapbox, you know what I mean? And it can really damage you. And all my opinions are moderate about most things, you know what I mean? So like God, this I've got no opinions to share that are controversial. But I you can you can get yourself in a lot of trouble on it. Even with Rangers and Celtic stuff. Right. You know, and stuff like that. All sorts, do you know what I mean? That's part of our community, you know, it's something we need to be aware of. And you can quite easily alienate half your community, you know. Um, um, so there's a question in the chat. How was it when folk started reaching out to you? Um, if you drunk therapy podcast, BBC, etc. Was that when you realised you had made an impact and started making people question what is going on in society today? I think, to be honest with you, right, with the, like, the grassroots stuff, like podcasts and all that, that was such an important part because, guys, I hadn't done any public speaking, right? I, I wasn't in the debate society in university. I barely went to uni, you know what I mean? So for me, right, doing all that stuff, right, and being asked to do all that stuff was so useful. And I know quite a few artists that turn their nose up at small stuff because they think if they've had big stuff, they don't do small stuff anymore, right? And for me, I did it all, right? I did so much that first year, right? I did every podcast anybody asked me because it was a chance to speak, right? And the craft, you know, speaking's a craft. I just did a um, remembrance event for Bamalola Taylor, right? In Glasgow, and I spoke a keynote speech for 45 minutes, right? Now, if you had told me I would have done that a few years ago, I would not have believed it. I couldn't have believed it. I was naturally anxious. I would take panic attacks before I would go up, you know? And I could hold all these people, over 100 people's attention for 45 minutes is a big deal, you know. Mm. And, um, you know, I got great feedback for that. So it was the small stuff that helped me, you know. So I was so grateful for that. It's so experienced. I still do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do that. If you're ever an artist and you get asked to do something talking-wise, just do it. Even if you're terrified, just get it done. I love that. What, how do you, how do you get over your fear? Oh, God, I don't know. Like, uh, my first time in London, um, I was in Pacador and I was literally, I was first up, and that's unfortunately because of my surname. I'm usually billed first. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Armstrong. So, um, <clears throat> I'm up first, you know, um, and I was hiding in the toilets, guys, just panicking, just shiting myself, just going on, oh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die in front of everybody here. And uh, I came out of the toilet, right, and a guy went, where have you been? And I says, well, I was hiding in the toilet. 
and he said, and he said one of the funniest things anybody's like, he said, well, as long as you don't try and swim in it, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> he trains for a joke, know what I mean? And you know what? I think about that joke every time I go on stage. It's like a wee mantra now, so I just go, do you know what? I'll be all right, all right, let's go. You know, just dig in. You start small. You don't go into, you know, you don't go to Carnegie Hall. You go to the Churchill, you know what I mean? And then eventually you get to Carnegie Hall. Well, I did the Edinburgh Festival, right, this year. And it was like, it was like question time. Like, people were looking at me as an expert, right? No one had fair play. Somebody that knows stuff and, you know, has got something to add. And God, you just, I just research all this stuff, you know what I mean? And I talk lots, right? And, and all the small stuff, right? Doing the local stuff. And then that's like, that's like sparring, man. And then the big things are like the prize fight, you know? I think talk, I said, talk often. It's it yeah the experience well it, yeah confidence comes with experience but as you say it's also people connecting with people in the end. Yes. That's, uh, That's just pretty- like, be yourselves, man. Be human. Like I just talk the way I talk. Do you know what I mean? And I don't sanitize myself, and I don't think what do these people want of me. I just think who am I? That's a better question. Mm-hmm. And you know it's not how do I want to be perceived, but like just be yourself. Do you know what I mean? appropriate to the situation obviously I, st- I always show respect I always dress up you know like I dress you know you know what I mean I show yeah. respect I show respect in my tone but like I don't change my accent I don't change the things I've got to say whether you know I say things sometimes that people don't like you know talking about violence talking about things that they don't want artists like me to have a voice they want you know that to be politicians and you know other people but that's my duty to mm-hmm. disrupt and say things you know like that it's not easy to disrupt and say things totally um i sometimes ask this and it's funny i I get a feeling that you'll have a different answer but um to me what's interesting is in coming back to the idea of identity what makes a piece of art scottish do you have like what's your thing well you know what i'm gonna say Uh, linguistic um, (laughs) purity that's that's probably uh, Mm -hmm. i don't know for me, right, um, why why should we speak in standard English? I wrote an essay for the Literature Alliance saying that, you know what, standard English is my second language. My first language is the voice I'm speaking to you right now, right? It's the voice that's inside my head when I'm going through Morrison's and I say, do I need a tin of beans or what do I need? Do you know what I mean? It's my own voice. It's my internal voice. It's my spoken voice and it's my written voice. Right? Of course, I'm not going to write my PhD critical accompaniment in dialect because I realise that there's an academic language I need, but that's a second language, right? Of course, if I go for a job interview, I'm not going to be like, right, man, what's happening, my man? He's a job and all that, right? That's the way I talk to my pals. That's the way I talk in a pub, you know what I mean? But if I, it's a bit change. And see people say that's code switching. I don't code switch. I'm just the way I'm at it. It's just changing your register slightly to be appropriate for the moment. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. That's, not, that's not being artificial, you know what I mean? That's just being respectful. And showing a certain level of um, adaptability is also something, I think that's sort of, you know, that's also how we survive. But um, I was just thinking about that, that I don't know why it came to my mind when I was listening to the young team, that as he doesn't speak to his mom the same way he speaks to his friends. But I mean, I think that's true for course, everyone, but course, it's with just, that level of linguistics, like it's, it's just different. We need it, right? We need it. And our parents draw it into us and they know my my mum was not a linguist, believe me, but she knew that if I went into a job interview and I was saying I and no and yous and that, that I might not get the job because, you know what, there's a social stigma we work in class for that girl accents, right? So when people sometimes look at me funny and they go kind of like, do you know, believe it or not, right? I get treated differently, right? I, I was living in St Andrews for a while there, right? And like, see when I go in shops, right? Or I talk to my GP and all that, you get treated differently because they think like they, there's a social stigma because of the way I speak, right? And I feel it. And, you know, my partner was foreign, right? She felt it. She can see, she's like, they weren't taking you seriously because of the way you're speaking. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to change the way I speak. You know, it's them that needs to change the stigma and the prejudice against working class people. It's not me that needs to change because God, I am who I am. You know what I mean? And I'm proud to be where I am. And then, what kind of advocate would I be for North Lanark, sir? If I go on the BBC and say, hey, old boy, I'm never going to do that. I'll never betray my place. You know what I mean? Because I betray myself if I do that. Mm. So I think we're reaching um, the last question um, that I've got for you, guys. There's an- another four minutes if you have one last question for Graham. Um, I guess what top advice would you give um, film and TV students about creating and being creative about their, you know, their creative lives? You know what? 
TV and film, right, is a different animal, right? But I would say, but you know what? Somebody told me, and who's a well-known TV personality, she said to me, just remember it's a village out there, right? And that was a kind of ominous thing, right? And why always good advice, right? But I would say is, don't worry about other people's advice, right? Just worry about being the best you you can be, right? Be in it, be innovative, right? Don't try and copy people. Do your own thing, right? And whatever's true to you, that's what you're going to be best at, right? And you know what? See, if you believe in it and you go the distance, other people will feel it. They will feel it, right? And I went through years of detection and doubt with my project, right? But now, like reading pilot, the pilot of something that I had in my head when I was 21 years old is a good feeling. But I, and it's that's accessible for everybody. There's a there's a drought of good drama in this country and authentic voices and people that like, um, you know what I mean? Like, God, we are the texture of this country. This country is a working class country. Like, I'm sick of period dramas. Honestly, Mom, I walk in and my mom's watching Downton Abbey and I'm like, fuck's sake. No, again, man. What? <laughs> Turn the channel there. Where's the people that, you know what I mean? I don't want to see top parts and tails. I want to see trackies. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, bo- I'm bored, right? The people that be there, boring. Change your record, man. Just come out with authentic things. I want to read about people in working in retail and, like, I'm going to write a book about selling cars, you know what I mean? And just like the, left, the different lives in this country are there. And honestly, I think if you write true and you write hard, you will get there. Honestly, just get it, get it done. That's what I say. Just get it done. You know, that gun. Boom, mic drop, just get it done. <laughs> yeah, just get it done, just get it done. Don't take no for an answer, just knock down the door. Gate crash the party, right, and just tell them you're loud and proud and Scottish and you're here to tell a good story and that's it. And You know what I mean? We don't need all the fluff of it, or it. There's a last question from Shona, which I think is amazing. <laughs> have you ever thought of standing for political office and affecting... People have asked artists? me that a few things. That's a great question. People have asked me that a few things. Do you know what? Yeah, I strike you, somebody would pull the party line, or would get, I'd be like a, a backbencher just shouting the truth, you know what I mean? Nah, I don't think so. I don't, you know what, people have said it to me, they're like, you're the polished young guy that you could be it and all that, and I'm like, honestly, I'm not that polished, you know what I mean? Because I'm not going to toe the party line, I'll just say exactly what needs to be said, you know, and as an artist, by the way, that's my role, and sometimes I think we do that, you know, we look at, I look at politicians and police officers, and you feel inferior, but you know what, you're not, because... There's no strings above my head. I'll say what I like. And people still buy my books. You know, so it's important to have that because, you know what, I can tell the truth. And you know what, whether the truth's unpopular or not popular, right, and I need to advocate on behalf of young guys, right, because I don't hear a lot of people doing that. You know what I mean? And they are my people. They're my pals, wee bros and cousins. And, you know what I mean? I, and I want them to do well. I don't want them to kill themselves. You know, I don't want to kill themselves with drugs and drink or commit suicide. I want them to have happy lives and fulfil themselves and I want them to break away from this masculine nonsense. And I want them to take down the Scarface poster in the bedroom of their mind. You know, and that's about masculinity, right? And it's my duty to do that and to stand up before the world and bear my scars and say, do you know what? And I don't mean physical scars, I mean mental scars and say, do you know what? This it hurts, it hurts men or this. We can do better. You know, and that's, that's my role. That's my duty. Wow, well, I think that's a perfect place to end. Um, a very powerful conversation. Thank you so much, Graham. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Thanks for coming. And I'm sure that um, we'll hear a lot more from you and now that you're on our books. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back. Anything. I'll, I'll be, be back. back. Exactly. Only not funny, sir. Not funny, sir. <laughs> no, I mean, here we go. <laughs> Thank you so much.